Leviticus 26. Uh, you may not be aware of it, but uh, this particular chapter in the Bible is now a large controversy in Adventism. Uh, Leviticus 26. Um, if you notice the 1843 chart, when we had it up the first night, Leviticus 26 is the passage in the scriptures that William Miller identifies as identifying the seven times the 2520 year scattering period that was carried out against the northern and the southern kingdom. And in Leviticus 26 you have uh, one of the places in the scriptures where Moses sets forth the blessings and the cursings. He begins with the blessings and then he goes into the cursings and they're premised upon whether Israel would keep the covenant. So if you look at Leviticus 26 verse 1 it says you shall make no, you shall make you no idols nor a graven image neither rear up a stand a standing image neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it for I am the Lord your God you shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary I am the Lord if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them then I will give you rain in due season and the land shall increase or increase and the trees of the field shall yield her fruit and he continues to list off the blessings that would come upon ancient Israel if they would keep the covenant and keep the commandments but by the time Moses gets to verse 14 he says this but if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments and if you shall despise my statutes or if your soul abhor my judgments though that you will not do all my commandments but that you break my covenant and then he begins to list off the cursings that would come upon Israel for breaking the covenant and what William Miller was identifying fine is a time period and if you look at verse 18 it says, and if you, this is, this is in the narrative of the cursings for breaking the covenant, and if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And of course, the Millerites were, what was being opened up to them were the time prophecies, and they understood a time represented a year, and that there was 360 days in a biblical year, so seven times 360 came to 2,520 years. Um, notice verse... 21 and if you will walk contrary unto me and will not hearken to me I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins and then in verse 24 it says then will I also walk contrary unto you and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins and then in verse 28 it says then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury and I even I will chastise you seven times for your sins and it's from these expressions that William Miller concluded that when ancient Israel broke the covenant that there would be 2,520 years that they would be scattered into the other nations. Um, if you look at verse 33 in connection with that it says and I will s scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land should be desolate and your cities waste. Now just because we've been moving back and forth in these different rooms I didn't bring out the, the charts tonight. We'll bring them back out tomorrow night for the rest of the week but on the chart if you remember up in the upper right hand corner William Miller has the 2520 year time prophecy and he marks the beginning point when Manasseh was carried into captivity and next to 677 on that chart he has 2 Chronicles 3311 if you want to turn to 2 Chronicles 3311 which says Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. William Miller identified the beginning of the scattering, the beginning of the 2520, as the point in time when Manasseh was carried to Babylon, and history tells us that that was the year 677. And if you move 2,520 years into the future, the Millerites on the chart have the year 1843 marked, but they were misunderstanding the year zero when that chart was developed. So it actually extends out to 1844. Now, we gave you a handout um, from Hiram Edson, and Hiram Edson 
Um, he both Miller understood both these time prophecies, but he chose the time prophecy against the southern kingdom. And Hiram Edson said that he should have used the northern kingdom, but I'll stick to my notes, and or I'll, or I'll miss some stuff. In uh, on your notes, beginning there, you have what we've looked at many times this week: the endorsement of the 1843 chart by Sister White. We also have looked at the endorsement of the 1850 chart by Sister White, which also has the 2520 on it. But in Daniel 9, verses 11 and 13, which are in your note, it says, Yea, all Israel hath transgressed thy law, even by tardy, departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we've sinned against him. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Daniel is understanding the curse of Moses which we've looked at in Leviticus 26. There's other curses of Moses, but Daniel knew that they were captive in Babylon because the curse of Moses had been poured out upon them. He was familiar with it. Um, you'll find that, that that was Daniel's prayer, and you'll find in Nehemiah's prayer, which is a very similar prayer to Daniel's, and you have it in your notes from Nehemiah 1, verse, verses 6 and 8, and I'm just taking part of Nehemiah's prayer. Let, thou, let thine ear now be attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servants, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor statutes, nor the judgments, which thou hast commandedest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech ye, the word that thou commandest, commandedest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Now when you look at this subject in the scriptures, there's more than once where the scripture says that all the prophets, all the prophets identify the scattering. And if, once you see that, you'll see that the Bible is not making a mistake. It's a subject of every Bible prophet, the scattering of God's people. And the scattering is one of the terms that is applied to this time period. This is when Israel was scattered. Sometimes the prophets will call it the time of God's indignation as well. We'll look at that in the next quote. Deuteronomy 29, verses 27 to 29 says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them up out of the land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation. Now maybe that the, the fact that the curse against Israel from the Lord is called indignation. It may not mean a great deal to you, but the Word of God deals with God's indignation, and generally in Adventism, we haven't looked at it closely, so when we hear about God, God's indignation, we think it's the time period of the seven last plagues, and it is, but there are two indignations in God's Word. God's indignation that's poured out upon the, the lost at, after human probation closes, when Michael stands up, that is a subject of Bible prophecy, but there's also the indignation against Israel for breaking the covenant. So when you see the word indignation in the word of God, you have to determine by context whether it's identifying something in connection with the seven last plagues, or it's identifying something in connection with the scattering of Israel. Okay? And here... Um, you can see that Moses is identifying this indignation as a punishment against God's people. This isn't the punishment of the wicked after Michael stands up and human probation closes. For a second testimony to that, you have Ezekiel 22. And he hath violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. He hath destroyed his places of the assembly. The Lord has caused the solemn feast and Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion and hath despised in his indignation of his anger the king and the priest... That's Jeremiah, Lamentations 2, six, And then Ezekiel says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art a land that is not cleansed nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. This indignation is... These indignations that we just mentioned are indignations against God's people. This isn't the indignation of the seven last plagues. Let me show you something. If this may help you see that this is worth understanding... Turn, to, turn with me, this is 
probably not in your notes, but turn me with me, if you would, to uh, Daniel 11, verse 36. Daniel 11, verse 36 is one of the most controvers controversial verses in the history of Adventism. Whether you're familiar with that or not, the pioneer understanding of verse 36 is that the king that's being addressed here is the papacy. But there came a point in time in the 1870s, 1880s, where Uriah Smith decided that he was going to identify this king as Turkey. And from that point on, James White and Uriah Smith had an ongoing controversy um, in the two periodicals within the church. And this has been an, a subject of discussion until shortly after World War I, World War II in that time period. It, it, Uriah Smith's understanding that this king in verse 36 was Turkey has pretty much been set aside. So verse 36, whether you're aware of it or not, has been a point of discussion in Advent history based upon who this king is and the correct pioneer view of who this king is in verse 36 is this is the papacy. In fact, some Bible commentators, not even, not even Adventist Bible con commentators, Protestant commentators will tell you that verse 36 is the verse that Paul is paraphrasing when he talks about the man of sin sitting in the temple of God telling himself that he is God. He's paraphrasing verse 36 here. That's how much history is connected with verse 36 is this being an identification of the Pope of Rome. And it says in verse 36, and the king, the papacy, shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. This passage is talking about the papacy prospering until 1798. So this isn't the papacy pros prospering until the end of the world. This is about the papacy prospering until it receives the deadly wound in 1798. And the point is... There's an indignation that takes place in 1798 that is not the indignation of the seven last plagues. In order to understand this verse about the papacy, you have to understand what the indignation against God's people is. Okay? So, you, that may not mean a lot to you, but I'm trying to show you that there is reasons to make a distinction between these indignations. Now, on, on page two, you have a quote from William Miller. <coughs> Seven prophetic years would be seven times 360 equal to 2,520 years. This bondage must begin with the kingdom of Babylon, the first kingdom of Daniel's four monarchies, which kingdoms were to make war with the saints and prevail against them until the Ancient of Days came, and these were to scatter the people of God into all the kingdoms of the earth and have dominion over them and exercise authority upon them. When then, may we not ask, did the bondage of the children of God begin? I answer, when literal Babylon began to exercise authority over them. In the 22nd year of Manasseh's reign, in the year before Christ, 677, the last of the ten tribes were carried away, and Israel ceased to be a nation, according to the prophecy. William Miller, a trilogy, page 220. Now, one thing that we want to mark here, and I hope we already understand this, is that Israel was divided into two kingdoms. All right, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, and how many tribes were in the northern kingdom? Ten. The, the ten tribes are the northern kingdom. The other two tribes, the southern kingdom, and William Miller is mark. He's dealing with the twenty-five twenty against the southern kingdom that begins begins in his understanding when Manasseh was carried into captivity. We've already read Second Chronicles thirty-three. Um, passing down below that. Now, now there's an argument in Adventism, uh, there's an argument against the 2520 in Adventism today. It's not simply against the 2520. There's two arguments, so to speak. There's two focuses of the argument. Number one, there's an argument against the Millerite understanding of the 2520. But here in the last five years, those of us that have accepted the pioneer understanding of the 2520, we've come to understand truths connected with the 2520 that the pioneers did not see. So the argument today in Adventism against the 2520 on one hand is against the pioneer understanding, and then on the other hand it's against 
the new understanding that is built upon the pioneer understanding. So you have to, it's fair to let you know that some of what we're going to share on the 2520, the pioneers did not see or understand. One of the arguments that's raised is that Sister White never speaks about the 2520. But she does. She doesn't say 2520. But when you understand what the pioneers understood the 2520 to represent in the scriptures, then you can see places where she is specifically addressing it. But if you don't understand how the pioneers are understood the 2520, you can read right through those passages and not catch it. Now, in your notes, under Second Chronicle, right, where it says 677 B.C. James Usher's chronology, you have Second Chronicles 33, 9 through 11. We've already read verse 11. This is the place where William Miller says to start this prophecy in 677 because this is when Manasseh is carried into captivity. And the argument against this is this isn't when Israel was carried into Babylon as a nation, was it? This isn't when, this is bef well before when Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem. Okay, D Jerusalem isn't destroyed in 677. Jerusalem's destroyed after. So those people that have rejected the pioneer understanding, one of their arguments is, is that, you know, Manasseh, he repented. It can't be him. But notice what Sister White says in Prophets and Kings. Faithfully, the prophets continued their warnings and their ex exhortations. Fearlessly, they spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but the messages were scorned. Backsliding Judah would not heed. As an earnest of what would befall the people should they continue in penitent, the Lord permitted their king to be captured by a band of Assyrian soldiers who bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Sister White says that when Manasseh was carried to Babylon in 677, that it was an earnest. You know what an earnest is? A down payment. You ever heard of an earnest payment? It's the down payment. It's the first payment. Notice the quote from underneath that from the Webster's Dictionary of Sister White's Day and Age. It says, earnest, seriousness, a reality, a real event, as opposed to jesting or feigned appearance. Take heed that this jest do not one day turn to earnest and give in earnest what I beg us thee. Notice the first definition. First fruits. That which is in advance and gives promises of something to come. When Manasseh was carried into captivity in Babylon, that was the down payment of the scattering of ancient Israel. And Sister White is in total agreement with William Miller applying that to 677. And she's elaborating on it. But if you don't believe the Millerites are right, then you can read right through that passage and not see it. Um, the, on the next page, the last part of that definition says, this sense of the word is primary, denoting that which goes before or in advance. Manasseh is the beginning of the 2520 time prophecy. Then in 2 Kings 21, verses 10 through 15, it says, And the Lord spake by his servants the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Israel, had done these abominations, has, and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. Therefore this saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such an evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of the house of Ahab. What's he mean by that? He, he means that the northern kingdoms already went into captivity. And the punishment when, of them being scattered for breaking the covenant is going to be measured out against the southern kingdom because the northern kingdom went into captivity first. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of mine inheritance and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. And they shall become a prey and a spoil to their enemies because they have done that which is evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt. One more quote from Mr. Miller. It says, seven times in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. William Miller believed upon the testimony of two, and he applied the seven times of Daniel 4 and Nebuchadnezzar's punishment to as a second witness for this 2520. 
Okay, we've been, we've been looking at that as well, but here's what he says. Seven times in Nebuchadnezzar's dream was fulfilled in seven years. Nebuchadnezzar, for his pride and arrogance against God, was driven among the beasts of the field and was made to eat grass as oxen until seven times passed over him and until he learned that the Most High ruled in the kingdoms of men and gave it to whomsoever he would. This being a matter of history and as an allegory or sample to the people of God for their pride and arrogancy, arrogancy in refusing to be reformed by God and claiming the power and will to do these things themselves, they too, like Nebuchadnezzar, must be, be driven among the beasts of the field, meaning the kingdoms of the world, until they learn the sovereignty of God and that he dispenses his favor to whomsoever he will. That being a matter of history and a sample only was fulfilled in seven years, but this being a prophecy will be fulfilled fulfilled in seven prophetic times, which will be seven times 360, which will take 2,520 years. It's an interesting study to look at what Sister White says about William Miller. She says that angels of God regularly visited him and opened his mind to understand the prophecies. That's what's stated of William Miller, that the angels of God were the ones that opened his mind to the prophetic word. And what was being opened up in that history were the time prophecies. The increase of knowledge in that history had to do with the time prophecies in the Bible. So what time prophecy was the first time prophecy that William Miller discovered? The 2520. And you know what William Miller says about the 2520? That's the time prophecy that led him to understand the 2300 year prophecy. He first found the 2520 and that led him to the 2300 year prophecy. We don't understand that any longer. But there's, there's no way that William Miller separates the 2520 from the 2300. They're connected to each other. How many understand that, that the 1290 and the 1335 start at the same point in time? We may argue about what the daily is, but in Daniel 12, from the taking away of the daily is when you start the 1290 time prophecy and you start the 1335 at the same point in time, right? We're not arguing about what the daily is. They start at the same point in time. Therefore, those two prophecies, the 1290 and the 1335, are connected, are they not? Well, the 2520 and the 2300 year prophecies end at the same point in time. They're connected just as much as the 1290 and the 1335 are connected. And William Miller understood that logic. Um, y you'll notice in Leviticus 26, under iron and brass, in this cursing, that William Miller's building his time prophecy off of. One of the curses in there says, in verse 18, And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins, and I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your brass as earth. And he's using the story of Nebuchadnezzar as a second testimony, and Nebuchadnezzar was the tree, and the tree was cut down. And what happened to the tree when it was cut down? There was a band of iron and brass. So William Miller is very proficient at applying type, anti-type. And that's what he's doing with these two passages. And you can see Daniel 4, where the iron and brass is under that. Next page. Um, you can, well, I'll read it. Testimonies, Volume 2, page 661. The Lord made a covenant with Israel that if they would obey his commandments, he would give them rain in due season. That's Leviticus 26 he's speaking about. The land should yield her increase, and the trees of the field should yield their fruit. He promised that their threshing should reach unto the vintage, and, vin and the vintage unto the sowing time, and that they should eat their bread to the full, and dwell in their land safely. He would make their enemies to perish. He would not abhor them, but would walk with them, and would be their God, and they should be his people. But if they disregarded his requirements, he would deal with them entirely contrary to all this. His curse would rest upon them in place of a blessing. He would break the pride of their power, and would make the heaven over them as iron, and the earth as brass." Underneath that quote from Acts of the Apostles, she gives us some definitions about what iron and brass represent, both for Israel and Nebuchadnezzar. It says, It was then that the heavens were as brass over Paul, that he trusted mo most fully in God. More than most men, he knew the meaning of affliction. But listen to his triumphant cry as, beset by temptation and conflict, his feet press heavenward. Brass represents affliction and judgment. The next quote, Testimonies, Volume 4, page 172, their servitude was re represented by a yoke of wood, which was easily borne, but resistance would be met with corresponding severity represented by the yoke of iron. Severe ser servitude is iron. 
This here, and, I'm, and this is a very abbreviated, abbreviated commentary on William Miller's understanding of the 2520, but this line where I have south is William Miller's 2520. Shortly after the disappointment about 1856, James White was managing um, the Review and Herald magazine and he needed help with articles to be written to put in there and he asked Hiram Medson to help him write some articles and Hiram Medson started a series he never finished it's the series that we handed out here today and one of the premises of that series was is that he still understood and agreed with the 2520 but he thought William Miller was wrong in applying it to the southern kingdom Hiram Medson said it should have been applied to the northern kingdom because the northern kingdom went into captivity first and um, this book up here that if someone gets convicted that they need to understand Advent history this is a very good book and uh, I'll read you something out of it if I can turn to the page and if you determine you're going to buy this there's no discount because the plastic's off all right <laughs> and if I can't get this plastic off I won't read it to you I'll just tell it to you I think it's page 11 or it's page 21 and uh, in here Elder Dam Steed is telling us what the very basic foundational approach to the study of prophecy that the Millerites had. And every one of the Millerites understood this. They, they had a, a point of reference when they studied prophecy. Yeah, it's, I think it's 21. That is their, their main point of reference. And I probably, now that I'm thinking about it, I probably have this in the notes. And, but anyway. On page 21, 22, on 22 it says, in his analysis, in Miller's analysis of the persecuting powers of God's people throughout the ages, he developed the concept of two abominations defined as paganism, the first abomination symbolizing the persecuting force outside of the church, and the papacy, the second abomination per representing the persecuting power within the church. Every Millerite understood that when they were studying prophecy, it was describing two persecuting powers, paganism that was followed by papalism. So when Hiram Edson's making his argument about why this 2520 against the northern kingdom should be the one we point to, his argument was based on this. The northern kingdom went into captivity in 723. If you go 2520 years in the future, you come to 1798. This is the scattering of the northern kingdom. This is God's indignation against the northern kingdom. But if you take the very dead center of this 2520, you come to the year 538, and in so doing, you're illustrating two 1260-year time periods. 1260 years when paganism scattered God's people, followed by 1260 years when papalism scattered God's people. There's no way that's an accident. So every Millerite, when they heard that argument, they had to think, yeah, this, this is a pretty strong argument because this is what we understand Bible prophecy is built upon, is these two persecuting powers. And from this point on, in 1856, the 2520 kind of just dropped into obscurity and became opposed, forgotten, covered up with tradition and customs. And it sat there until about 2004. Okay. Okay, 2005. Uh, so here you have, here we, at the bottom of page four, we'll read a, a paragraph out of Hiram Edson's articles, which we handed out this evening. The validity, of the, the validity of the above testimony cannot be invalidated or impeached. Hence, there can be... By the way, how many remember who Hiram Edson is? I mean, the Lord had enough confidence in Hiram Edson to give him a vision immediately after the great disappointment. And in the vision, he's seen Christ moving from the holy place to the most holy place. And James and Ellen White had enough confidence in Hiram Edson to what? Name their son after him. So, he's not, he's not a minor, obscure... He's got his credentials, all right? He, even if he doesn't have letters behind his name. What? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, okay, the validity of the above testimony cannot be invalidated or impeached. Hence, there can be no room left for further doubt on this 
so clear a point. This then is the inspired historical event and its chronology, which is 723 BC is the point from which to reckon the 25 years captivity. Instead of reckoning from the taking of Manasseh, king of Judah, to Babylon, 677, we reckon from the shutting up and binding in prison of Hoshea, king of Israel, which was 723 BC. From whatever point in the year 723 we reckon, the same corresponding point in the year 1798 must be reached to fill up 25 20 full years. The same is, is, is the case of the 2300 days, dating from the fall of 457 and ending in the fall of 1844. The year 723 is the true beginning and 1798 the true terminus of the 2520 years captivity of the people of God. And we have a historical record of corresponding event transpiring in the year 1798 which perfectly answers the fulfillment of the prediction of the prophets which have foretold the events which mark the end of the 2,520 years indignation and captivity. So this is Hiram Edson giving a basic overview of what he taught in his articles that you have. Um, <coughs> from next page, from Jeremiah 50, 17 through 20, it says, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria hath devoured him, and last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon hath broken his bone. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land, as I have punished the king of Assyria. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation, and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Gilead in those days. And in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall, there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. The northern kingdom punished first, the southern kingdom punished second. That's historical fact. That's the way the scriptures set it out. You can see in your notes the, the math of these two time prophecies. But maybe, if you haven't looked at this before, maybe you've read Isaiah 7 verse 8. You have it in your notes. But let's read it from Isaiah. In Isaiah 7 verse 8, if you've ever read that, for, for years I read it. Um, and, I, and I always marked it. I wanted to understand it. And I never could understand it until I read Higher Medicine's articles. Then the lights came on. To have somebody explain it to you makes it a little bit easier. Um, in, in verse 8, there's a time prophecy of Isaiah 7. It says, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin, and within three score and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. What's three score and five years? Okay. And the key word there is within. It doesn't say in 65 years. It says within 65 years. Now, if you go to verse 1 with me in your Bibles. Let's walk through this for a minute. You'll, you'll notice that on these dates that what the pioneers are typically using is Usher's chronology. There's a lot of chronologists in the world, but the pioneers typically used Usher's, and those Sister White had several different authors of chronologies of Bible history in her personal library. Um, Ed Reed has documented and put in one of his books, whether it's even at the doors or the whatever the other book was, um, he documented that when Sister White's talking about the age of the earth, it, she was paraphrasing, she was gathering her information from ushers. And if you've ever seen a King James Bible that has the in the, the liner the years of the King James Bible. That's based upon Usher's too. So Usher's is the most reputable um, chronologist around. And Usher's dates verse 1 of Isaiah as the year 742. Okay. So here's, uh, here's what... Uh, is going on in 742. And it came to pass, verse 1, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah. It came to pass in 742 that Ahaz, the, the southern kingdom, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now what's going on here? Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom here, down here, the northern kingdom has formed an alliance with Syria, and the northern kingdom and, Assyri and Syria are about to attack the southern kingdom. And this is in 742. And verse 2 says, And it was told the house of David. Who's the house of David? It's the southern kingdom. 
and was told the house of David, saying, Syria, Syria is confederate, confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved in the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. When the southern kingdom heard that the northern kingdom had formed an alliance with Syria and was about to attack, they were shaking in their boots. They were moved like trees in the wind. They were afraid. Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, the prophets here at this time, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now and meet the king of Judah, Ahaz, thou and Shirjashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field, and say unto him, Take heed, and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for, for us, and set a king in the midst of it, e midst of it, even the son of Tabeel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. So uh, Ahaz, the king of Judah, the king of the south, is afraid about this confederacy, and the Lord says Isaiah t sends Isaiah to him, saying, Don't worry about it. This isn't going to come to pass. And then the verse we want to look at, verse 8, there's a prophecy. It says, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years shall Ephraim, who's Ephraim? The northern kingdom, Israel, Ephraim, that's the northern kingdom. Within 65 years, within, not in, within 65 years, Ephraim, shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. So, this prophecy is given in 742, and the prophecy is, is that within 65 years, the northern kingdom will be taken away into captivity. It will be scattered. God's indignation will be poured out upon it. And sure enough, 19 years later, the northern kingdom is carried into captivity. Now, the, the, that's all the verse says. But what the verse is also saying without saying anything is when you go 65 years in the future from 742, you come to the year 677, which is the year that the southern kingdom was scattered and carried into captivity. No way that's an accident. This 65-year time prophecy is marking the beginning of both of these 2,520-year time prophecies. Verse 9 says, And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. If you will not believe this prophecy, surely you will not be established. <coughs> okay. Um, So you have, you have another comment by William Miller and another comment by Howard Manson. We're going to move over those and go to page 6. Now we're moving into ground that the pioneers, they may have recognized, but they never thought about. <coughs> the one prophecy concludes in 1844, the other concludes in 1798. Amen? <coughs> and if you take 1798 and subtract it from 1844, how many years do you have? 46 years. From 1798 to 1844, we've been looking at this week. What is 1798 to 1844? That's the reform movement of the Millerites, is it not? That's the beginning point and the ending point. And it was 46 years long. Now, in John chapter 2, Christ cleansed the temple for the first time. Turn to John chapter 2, if you would. I'm trying to think in which presentation. Did we already talk about the two temple cleansings? Yeah, we talked about the two temple cleansings last night, didn't we? Okay, we've already prepared the way. There was two temple cleansings in the time of Christ. There's two temple cleansings in the Millerite history. And there's two temple cleansings in the history of the 144,000. Okay? And in the history of Christ, in John chapter 2, you have the first temple cleansing. And... As soon as Christ cleansed the temple, in verse 18, after he's, he's done that work, it says, Then as answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? You've cleansed the temple, give us a sign. 
demonstrating your authority to do these things. And then in verse 19, Jesus says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. What, what did the Jews think he was talking about? The literal temple. But he was talking about his body. Notice the next verse. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? How many years did it take to build the temple? Forty-six years. The Millerite temple was built in forty-six years. Now, there's lots of things that you can develop from this truth if you wish to see it. Number one is this subject right here. What was the argument they used to crucify Christ? This man said he would destroy... <laughs> no, that, that was the logic, but the, the, false, the false testimony was is this man said he would destroy the temple. This is the argument that they used to put later to put Christ on the cross. In other words, if Christ is giving us an illustration of the end of the world in his life, and he is, then perhaps the argument where the shaking reaches its highest point in Adventism at the end of the world is over this particular subject. And the Jews said it took 46 years to build the temple. And when Moses went on the mount to receive the instruction for building the temple. How many days was he on the mount? 46. 46. <laughs> Look at it very closely. Because Who's the first person that sets forth the year-day principle of Bible prophecy in the Bible? In the Bible. Moses. Moses was 46 days in receiving the instructions on building the earthly temple. The Jews said it took 46 years to build the temple. And there's, there's no... You can't... There's no evidence to, sh to show that there's any historical 46 years that you can apply to the earthly temple. We've looked. This is a prophetic uh, marker that's pointing forward to the development of the Millerites at the end of the world. But we've read this once perhaps before. In Great Controversy 426, it says, The coming of Christ is our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14. You remember reading this last night? The coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days is presented in Daniel 7.13. And the coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of the same event. When Malachi comes to the temple on October 22, 1844, in Malachi, what does it say? The messenger of the covenant suddenly comes to his temple. Does it not say that? But wasn't Christ already in the temple? Didn't he ascend to the temple after he was crucified? And wasn't he in the holy place until 1844 when he moved into the holy place? See, Malachi is teaching a different lesson. It's talking about the messenger of the covenant suddenly coming to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant is Christ. But Malachi is teaching a prophetic truth about the Lord entering back into covenant with modern Israel. And he had to raise up a temple to enter into covenant with and to suddenly enter into before that could happen. And he raised up the temple from 1798 to 1844, the temple that he was going to enter into covenant with. Did, did Christ enter into covenant with modern Israel on October 22nd, 1844? Why? Because the promise was that if Israel broke the covenant, he would scatter them for 2,520 years, but at the end of the scattering, he would gather them to himself. And in 1844, he was gathering Israel back unto himself to enter into covenant with them. This is all about the covenant, but in order for the messenger of the covenant in Malachi to suddenly come to his temple, he has to build a temple. And how long does it take to build a temple? 46 years from 1798 to 1844. And that's what these two time prophecies are about. They're about the broken covenant, the scattering, and the gathering. Okay, let me show you something. 
if I, if you will, I better look at this before I get off track. I, I like this study, but um, uh, we, we got some time. Let's say that this here, this here, this, this is the northern kingdom, and this here, this is the southern kingdom. Do you know that there's a prophecy in the word of God that says that at the end of the world, God's preachers or speakers are going to stand in front of God's people and do this. Did you know that? And when they do it, yeah, that's better. He's seen this. When they do it, then you know what happens? According to the prophecy, the people are going to say, What's that mean? You want to see that prophecy? Turn with me to Ezekiel 37. <coughs> Verse 15. <coughs> the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Are you in Ezekiel 37, verse 15? <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> da, 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 da. Ezekiel 37 verse 15 says this. Now remember, all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, right? The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick. This is a stick here. All right. Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel his companions. So Ephraim, Judah, two sticks. And join them together into one stick. They're joined together into one stick, are they not? Okay. And join them together into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Will thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Do you want to know what, what is meant by these? You have to ask, according to the prophecy. <laughs> okay, and then verse 19 says, Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, northern kingdom, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and will make them one stick, and they shall be one in thine hand. This is a prediction about some point in time when the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were going to be joined back together and be one kingdom. Okay, now notice this. Where did I leave off? I read 20 though, right? Verse 20. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. Look up here. They're before your eyes. These are the two sticks. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, and whither they have gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them how many nations? One nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall no more they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, so they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And David my servant shall be the king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, they shall all also walk in my judgment and observe my statutes and do them and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant wherein your fathers have dwelt and they shall dwell therein even they and their children and their children's children forever and my servant David shall be the prince forever moreover now notice this I will make a covenant of peace with them when they become one stick is when the covenant is made and the covenant with modern Israel made on October 22nd, 1844, at the end of the 2520 time prophecy. Moreover, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be for an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them. That's when they understood what the heavenly sanctuary was, is on October 22nd, 1844. Forevermore, my tabernacle also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify them, Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them 
forevermore. The scattering of these two kingdoms is represented by two sticks. And Ezekiel has a prophecy that says these two sticks are going to become one stick when the Lord enters back into covenant with Israel. And that took place on October 22nd, 1844 when the messenger of the covenant suddenly came to his temple. It took him 46 years to build that temple. And it isn't an accident that these 46 years are bookended by two 25-20 time prophecies. Okay. Um, so, we're doing good on time. William Miller used Nebuchadnezzar as the second witness to this 25-20 time prophecy. Okay. But he didn't see, and neither did Hiram Edson see, that Daniel chapter 5 is the second testimony to this 25-20 time prophecy. Notice on your notes in page 6. <coughs> the, the pronouncement against Belshazzar was many, many tekel yefarsin, and Daniel gave interpretation of what it was, but the many, many tekel yefarsin also possesses a monetary value, um, and it's broken down for us here. A tekel is 20 gerahs. Um, a Babylonian many is 50 tekels, and 50 times 20 is 1,000. And a peres, or a eupharsin, is half a many, so you can see the breakdown. The point being is that in this kingdom here, the second testimony that William Miller points to for the 2520 that is carried out against the southern kingdom is Nebuchadnezzar's seven times. But for this kingdom, the second testimony is Belshazzar. Why do I say that? Because the story of the northern kingdom is a kingdom that is removed and gone. The promise for restoration was for Judah. Nebuchadnezzar is the story about a kingdom taken away and restored. And when it's restored, it's one kingdom. So you have two witnesses here from the book of Daniel that are very powerful when you begin to wrap your mind around it. Um, notice on page 7, you know, there's an argument that's going on now that if you use the biblical value of the shekel and the many and the Epharsin, that you, this 2520 calculation of, of monetary value doesn't work out. But if you use the Babylonian value, it does work out. And notice on, on page 7, under the interpretation, the quote from Uriah Smith, what he says. And if you've ever asked yourself why this is the case, what Uriah Smith is going to comment on, it probably has something to do with this 2520. It says, whatever else the ancient magi magicians and astrologers, astrologers may have been efficient in, they seem to have been thoroughly schooled in the art of drawing out sufficient information to form a basis for some shrewd calculation or of framing their answers in so ambiguous a manner that they would be equally applicable, applicable let the event turn either way. In the present case, true to their cunning instincts, they called upon the king to make known to them his dream. If they could get full information respecting this, they could easily agree on some interpretation which would not endanger their reputation. They addressed themselves to the king in Syriac, a dialect of, a dialect of the Chaldean language which was used by the educated and cultured classes. From this point to, and that's Daniel, Two verse three to the end of chapter seven, the record continues in Chaldaic. From chapter two to chapter seven, the book of Daniel is not written in Hebrew; it's written in the Babylonian language. And you really, Sister White says that Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar they have a type-anti-type -type 
relationship. I don't know if we've read that quote yet, but we have the quote. We're going to read it tomorrow again if we haven't. If the punishment against Nebuchadnezzar was 25-20 and they have a type anti-type relationship, you don't have to stretch it too far to understand that the 25-20 that's encoded in the many, many Tekel Yafarsan is the type anti-type relationship between them both. But those people that are arguing against these things, things today say that if you use the Hebrew calculation of many, many Tekel Yafarsan that the math doesn't work. But if you use the Babylonian calculation, it works just fine. And have you ever asked yourself, why is it that chapter 2 to chapter 7 of the book of Daniel is not written in Hebrew? This may be one of the reasons. Notice Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorers of paths to dwell in. At the end of the world, God's people are asleep. They're in a Laodicean condition. In Ezekiel 37, we started in verse 15, but in the first 14 verses of Ezekiel 37, Sister White says the first 14 verses of Ezekiel 37 is the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world. And what are the first 14 verses of Ezekiel 37? It's a valley of dead, dry bones. At the end of the world, God's people are asleep. That's why Sister White says in Selected Messages, book 1, page 121, the great, our greatest need is to seek for a revival. This should be our first work. That's paraphrased, but that's what she says. And in Page 128 in the same book, she says a revival represents a renewal of spiritual life. If our greatest need and our first work is to seek for a revival, it means we're spiritually dead. At the end of the world, God's people are asleep, they're dead, they're a valley of dead, dry bones, they're in a Laodicean condition. Testimonies to ministers, Sister White says, when we understand the books of Daniel and Revelation as we should, there will be seen among us a great revival. What brings God's people back to life is prophecy. That's what Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37 is saying. He's told to prophesy to the bones and the bones come back to life, a mighty army. We'll look at that before we're done here this week. But here we are at the end of the world. We don't know the pioneer understanding of these foundational truths any longer. And now that they're being understood and agitated, there's voices in Adventism that say we will not walk therein. And what we're, uh, we're attempting to do this week is not only acquaint you with the foundational truths, but at the same time, probably more importantly, awaken you to the fact that the controversy that takes place about the foundational truths, it's already underway. It's already underway. And we either come to grips with those truths, understand and accept them for what they are, and get up on the wall and determine never to get down, or we're going to get shaken out of Adventism in the very near future. So we'll take a break now and we'll, we'll come back and, and try to tie some of the, these foundational truths together a little bit tighter. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the work that was accomplished by the faithful men during the Millerite history. We ask that you would give us the the willingness and the determination to go back and become familiar with these truths, familiar with the logic that was employed by these men to recognize and identify these things. We wish to be among those that walk in the old paths and, and encourage others to do so. We wish to be among those to give the trumpet a certain sound. We ask that this week would be a, a place that we can all point back to and say that um, we, we went further in this uh, this commitment to do these things with you because of the time we've been spending here this week. We ask for the continued presence of your Holy Spirit and your angels the rest of this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>